in Llano County here in Texas in the library district. The librarian was informed by her, um, was told by her supervisor, the director of the library system, it's a three branch system, to take um, a particular book, it doesn't say what book, it was uh, believed that it might talk about critical race theory, but it was a public library. They were told to take it off the shelves and put it behind the desk. And they said, oh, okay, I'll see what I can do about that. And then they just didn't because, why? And then the book did disappear from the shelf and ended up behind the thing. And then they told them, you have to stop buying new books now. And then they got rid of half of the library board, the community board. And then they assigned new people to it who agreed with the people remaining. And then the library board to close its meetings to the public. And then the library board decided that they would not be using their online book provider. They switched to a different one and suddenly 12 more books were missing and our librarian was fired. She was called insubordinate. She was making a problem. Texas challenges to books lead the nation, aren't we proud? And so what I wanna do with you here today is I'm just gonna read you excerpts from three books that have been banned or challenged um, throughout Texas in school districts in public libraries and they've also been challenged throughout the United States it's not even a problem in the south anymore you know we can go straight to Michigan or Oregon and find plenty of people doing the same the good news is librarians are amazing and they don't take any crap when it comes to freedom of speech uh, so, the lawsuit uh, that has been brought by that librarian and other uh, members of the community is going to be heard soon, but it's just worth noting that that's a thing that's happening. So what I want to start with really quick, I would, I've basically just looked at the list, oh, yeah, I'll tell you something in a minute, but I looked at the list of books that have been banned and challenged, and then I looked at my bookshelves, and gosh, there were just, <laughs> oh, so many. So one of them is this book, The Hate You Give, by Angie Thomas. Angie Thomas wrote this book as a response and in solidarity with the Black Lives Matter movement. It is a story of a 16-year-old young woman named Star, whose father owns a convenience store in a black neighborhood, and who lives life there and, and does the best she can, and um, some events that happen. And all I'm gonna read you is, I'm gonna read you chapter two. It's a short chapter, and it kind of spoils the whole book, but also doesn't spoil a darn thing. So you're gonna be ready to read it when I'm done, I hope. Because it's a great book. It's also a good movie, I've heard. When I was 12, my parents had two talks with me. One was the usual birds and bees. Uh, I didn't really get the usual version. My mom, Lisa, is a registered nurse, and she told me what went where and what didn't need to go here, there, or any damn where till I was grown. <laughs> Back then, I doubted anything was going anywhere anyway. While all the other girls sprouted breasts between sixth and seventh grade, my chest was as flat as my back. The other talk I got was about what to do if a cop stopped me. Mama fussed and told Daddy I was too young for that. He argued that I wasn't too young to get arrested or shot. Sixteen, remember. Thirteen, when she got this lecture. Star Star, you do whatever they tell you to do, he said. Keep your hands visible. Don't make any sudden moves. Only speak when they speak to you. I knew it must have been serious. Daddy has the biggest mouth of anybody I know, and if he said to be quiet, I knew I needed to be quiet. I hoped somebody had had the talk with Khalil, the boy she just left the party with to drive home. He cusses under his breath as the lights appear in the rearview mirror, turns the Tupac down, and maneuvers the Impala to the side of the street. We're on Carnation, where most of the houses are abandoned and half the street lights are busted. There's nobody around us, there's nobody around but us and the cop. Khalil turns the ignition off. Wonder what this fool wants. The officer parks and puts his brights on. I blink to keep from being blinded. 
I remember something else Daddy said. If you're with somebody, you better hope they don't have nothing on them or both of y'all going down. Okay, you don't have anything in the car, do you? I ask. He watches the cop in his side mirror. Nah. The officer approaches the driver's door and taps the window. Khalil cranks the handle to roll it down. As if we aren't blind enough, the, life, the officer beams his flashlight in our faces. License, registration, and proof of insurance. Khalil breaks a rule. He doesn't do what the cop wants. What you pull us over for? License, registration, proof of insurance. I said, what you pull us over for? Khalil, I plead, do what he said. Khalil groans and takes his wallet out. The officer follows his movements with the flashlight. My heart pounds loudly, but Daddy's instructions echo in my head. Get a good look at the cop's face. If you can remember his badge number, that's even better. With the flashlight following Khalil's hands, I make out the numbers on the badge. 115. He's white, mid-30s, early 40s. Has a brown buzz cut and a thin scar over his top lip. lip. Khalil hands the officer his papers and license. 115 looks over them. Where are you two coming from tonight? None ya, says Khalil, mean none, meaning none of your business. What you pull me over for? Your tail light's broken. So are you going to give me a ticket or what? You know what? Get out of the car, smart guy. Man, just give me my ticket. Get out of the car. Hands up where I can see them. Khalil gets out with his hands up. 115 yanks him by his arm and pins him against the back door. I, I fight to find my voice. He didn't mean... Hands on the dashboard, the officer barks at me. Don't move! I do what he tells me, but my hands are shaking too much to be still. He pats Khalil down. Okay, smart mouth, let's see what we find on you today. You ain't gonna find nothing, Khalil says. 115 pats him down two more times and turns up empty. Stay here, he tells Khalil, and you, he looks in the window at me. Don't move. I can't even nod. The officer walks back to his patrol car. My parents haven't raised me to fear the police, just to be smart around them. They told me it's not smart to move while a cop has his back to you. Khalil does. He comes to his door. It's not smart to make a sudden move. Khalil does. He opens the driver's door. You okay, Star? Pow! One. Khalil's body jerks. Blood spatters. He holds onto the door to keep himself upright. Pow! Two. Khalil gasps. Pow! Three. Khalil looks at me, stunned. Falls to the ground. I'm ten again, watching my best friend drop. An ear-splitting scream emerges from my gut, explodes in my throat, and uses every inch to be heard. Instinct says, don't move, but everything else says, check on Khalil. I jump out the Impala and rush around to the other side. Khalil stares at the sky as if he hopes to see God. His mouth is open like he wants to scream. I scream loud enough for the both of us. No, 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 is all I can say. Like, I'm a year old and it's the only word I know. And I'm not sure how I end up on the ground next to him. My mom once said that if someone gets shot, try to stop the bleeding, but there's so much blood, there's too much blood. No, 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 no. Khalil doesn't move. He doesn't utter a word. He doesn't even look at me. His body stiffens, and he's gone. I hope he sees God. Someone else screams. I blink through my tears. Officer 115 yells at me, pointing the same gun he killed my friend with. Put my hands up. Texas State Representative Matt Krause. <laughs> Correct. In October of last year, sent a letter to the school districts. He's on the Texas you know, Education Committee because that's where we want that guy. And the letter said, um, I'm concerned about some books. I'd like you to send me the information. Um, I want you to tell me 
Do you have these books in your school district? How much did they cost and how many copies do you have? The list was 16 pages long and contained 850 titles. That was on it. And the next book I'm going to read from was on it. Less uh, horrifying, I hope. Another book that was easily accessible on my bookshelf and that has made a huge difference in my life has been The Color Purple. And as many of you know, this book has been banned again and again and again. It has the temerity to be a literate and beautiful book by a woman of color. And it also has the temerity to talk about women loving women. My goodness, how dare they? <laughs> well, there is a good thing that happens. Should, uh, the book is about Celie, who is an African-American woman in the deepest of poverty in the South, and her upbringing, starting with, you know, sexual abuse and uh, physical abuse and emotional abuse and children that are born and then taken away and then marrying one person because they were told they had to. You know, it was just a long, hard life. Um, and the new thing that happened to them is uh, they met a woman named Shug. And Shug was a nightclub singer and just a, an artist and just too cool for school in general. And Shug and Seely, when you put them together, made something strong and beautiful. And with Shug's help, and with her own help, Celie also uh, restored her ties to her broken family, those who she could, um, including one of her sisters who became a refugee, uh, not a refugee, a missionary in Africa who was writing letters about building things in the village. And so this begins a portion of the book that's just a long back and forth of letters between Celie and uh, her sister Nettie. And there's a there's a good letter that I want to read to you. <laughs> Dearest Nettie, sometimes I think Suge never loves me. I stand looking at my naked self in the looking glass. What would she love? I ask myself. My hair is short and kinky because I don't straighten it anymore. Once Suge says she love it, no need to. My skin is dark. My nose is just a nose. My lips just lips. My body just any woman's body going through the changes of age. Nothing special here for nobody to love. No honey-colored curly hair. No cuteness. Nothing young and fresh. My heart must be young and fresh, though it feels like it's blooming blood. I talk to myself standing in front of the mirror. Celie, I say, happiness was just a trick in your case. And just because you never had any before Suge, you thought it was time to have some and that it was going to last. Even though you had the trees with you, the whole earth, the stars, but look at you. When Suge left, happiness deserted. Every once in a while, I get a postcard from Suge. I know you hate me for keeping you from Nettie, her husband says, but now, now, she's gone, and he's gone. I don't hate him, Nettie. I don't believe that you are dead. How can you be dead if I can still feel you? Maybe like God, you changed into something different that I'll have to speak to in a different way, but you're not dead to me, Nettie, and you never will be. Sometimes when I get tired of talking to myself, I talk to you. I talk to the children. Mister still can't believe I have children. Where do you get children from, he asked. My stepdaddy, I say. You mean he knowed he was the one that damaged you all along, he asked. I say, yeah. Mister shook his head. After the, all the evil he done, I know you wonder why I don't hate him, Nettie. Well, I don't hate him for two reasons. One, he loves Suge. And two, Suge used to love him. Plus, it looks like he's trying to make something out of himself. I don't mean just that he's working and he cleans up after himself and appreciates some of the things God was playful enough to make. I mean, when you talk to him now, he really listened. And one time, out of nowhere in the conversation us was having, he said, Celie, I'm satisfied this is the first time I ever lived on Earth as a natural man. It feels like a new experience. 
Sophia and Harper are always trying to set me up with some man. They know I love Suge, but they think women's just love by accident. Anybody handy likely to do. Every time I go to Harpo, some little policy salesman get up all in my face. The minister has to come to the door. You tell the man, this lady my wife. The man vanishes out the door. We'll sit and have a cold drink, talk about our days together with Shug, talk about the time she came home sick, the little crooked song she sang all our fine evenings down at Harpo's. Remember the night so Sophia knocked Mary Agnes' tooths out? <laughs> he asked. Who could forget it? We don't say nothing about Sophia's troubles. Can't laugh at that. I wonder if she told... <laughs> so then, uh, sorry, sorry. Goes into like the details of life. So sorry, I had it highlighted and it seems to have vanished. All right. Sophia raised me practically, said Miss Eliza Jane, Eleanor Jane. I don't know what we would have done without her. Well, says Stanley Earl, everybody around here was raised by the colored. That's how come we turn out so well. He winked at me and says, well, sugar pie to Miss Eleanor Jane, time for us to mosey along. She leapt up like somebody stuck her with a pin. How Henrietta doing, she asked. Then she whispered, I brought her something so well hood with yams she won't ever suspect. She put yams into a tuna casserole. Well, says Sophia, one thing you have to say for Miss Eleanor Jane, her dish is almost always full Henrietta. Finally, the end come to Miss Sophia, to Sophia and Miss Eleanor Jane, and it wasn't nothing to do with Henrietta, who hates Miss Eleanor Jane's guts. Henrietta is Nettie. It was Miss Eleanor Jane herself and that baby she went and had. Every time Sophia turned around, Miss Eleanor Jane was shoving Reynolds Stanley Earl in her face. He had a little fat white something without much hair. Looked like he was headed for the Navy. <laughs> Ain't little Reynolds sweet, says Miss Eleanor Jane to Sophia. Daddy just loves him, she says. Love having a grandchild named for him and looks so much like him, she says. Sophia doesn't say anything, standing there ironing some of Susie Q and Henrietta's clothes. And so smart, says Eleanor Jane. Daddy says he never saw a smarter baby. Stanley Earl's mama says he's smarter than Stanley Earl was when he was this age. Sophia still don't say nothing. Finally, Eleanor Jane notices. And you know how some white folks is, they will not let well enough alone. If they want to bad enough, they are gonna harass a blessing from you if it kills. Sophia was mighty quiet this morning, Miss Eleanor Jane say, like she was just talking to Reynolds Stanley. He stared back at her out of his big bug eyes. Don't you think he's sweet? She asked Sophia again. He's sure fat, says Sophia, turning over the dress she's ironing. And he's sweet too, says Miss Eleanor Jane. Just as plump as he can be, says Sophia, and tall. But he's sweet too, says Eleanor Jane, and he's smart. She hauled off and kissed him upside the head. He rubbed his head and said, Yee, ain't he the smartest baby you ever saw, she asked Sophia. Well, he got a nice size head on him, says Sophia. You know, some people place a lot of weight on head size, not a whole lot of hair on it either. He's going to be cool this summer for sure. She folded the piece of clothes she was ironing and put it on a chair. Just a sweet, cart, smart, cute, innocent little baby boy, says Miss Eleanor Jane. Don't you just love him? She asked Sophia, point to point. Sophia sighed. She set down her iron. She stared at Miss Eleanor Jane and at Reynolds Stanley. All the time, me and Henrietta was over in the corner playing patty pat. Henrietta act like Miss Eleanor Jane ain't alive, but both of us hear the way the iron sound when Sophia put it down. That sound has a lot of old and new stuff in it. No, ma'am, says Sophia. I do not love Reynolds Stanley Earl. Now, that's what you've been trying to find out since he was born, and now you know. Me and Henrietta looked up. Miss Eleanor Jane just that quick done put Reynolds Stanley down on the floor where he crawling around, knocking stuff over, heads straight for Sophia's stack of ironed clothes and pulls it down on his head. Sophia takes up the clothes, straightens them out, and stands by the ironing board with her hand on the iron. 
Sophia is the kind of woman that no matter what she has in her hand, it looks like a weapon. Eleanor Jane starts to cry. She's always felt something for Sophia. If not for her, Sophia never would have survived living in her daddy's house. But so what? Sophia never wanted to be there in the first place, never wanted to leave her own children. Well, it's too late to cry, Miss Eleanor Jane, says Sophia. All we can do now is laugh. Look at him, she says. And she does laugh. He can't even walk, and already he's in my house messing it up. Did I ask him to come? Do I care whether he's sweet or not? Will it make any difference in the way that he will grow up to treat me what I think? You just don't like him because he looks like Daddy, says Miss Eleanor Jane. You don't like him because he looks like your Daddy, says Sophia. I don't feel nothing about him at all. I don't love him. I don't hate him. I just wish he wouldn't run loose all the time messing up folk stuff. All the time? All the time? says Miss Eleanor Jane. Sophia, he's just a baby, not only even a year old. He's only been here five or six times. Well, I feel like he's been here forever, says Sophia. I just don't understand, says Miss Eleanor Jane. All the other colored women I know love children. The way you feel is something unnatural. I love children, says Sophia. But all the colored women that say they love yours is lying. They don't love Reynolds Stanley any more than I do. But if you so badly raised as to ask them, what do you expect them to say? Some colored people are so scared of white folks, they claim to love the cotton gin. <laughs> but he's just a little baby, says Miss Eleanor Jane, like this is supposed to cl clear everything up. Well, what do you want from me, says Sophia. I feel something for you because out of all the people in your daddy's house, you showed me some human kindness. But on the other people, out of all the people in your daddy's house, I showed you some. Kind feeling is all I have to offer you. I don't have nothing to offer your relatives, but just what they offer me. I don't have nothing to offer him. Reynolds Stanley, by this time, is over on Henrietta's pallet, looking like he's trying to climb her foot. Finally, he starts to chew her leg, and Henrietta reaches up on the window sill and hands him a cracker. I feel like you're the only person that loves me, says Miss Eleanor Jane. Mama only loves Junior, she says, because that's who Daddy really loves. Well, says Sophia, you got your own husband to love you now. Look like you don't love nothing but that cotton gin, she says. Ten o'clock at night, he's still down there working. Maybe you ought to leave him, says Sophia. You got Ken Atlanta. Go stay with some of them. Get a job. <laughs> Miss Eleanor Jane tosses her hair back and acts like she doesn't even hear this. It's such a wild notion. <laughs> I got my own troubles, says Sophia. And when Reynolds Stanley grows up, he's going to be one of them. It's been really terrible to read about all the ways people are trying to silence voices um, from the margins. Of the 850 books, you know, I didn't like sit down and do a statistical analysis. Someone has, I'm sure. I couldn't find it on Google. But the authors are almost entirely fitting into certain categories. They're queer or they're black, or Hispanic, or Asian, or they're women, or they're all of those things. Oh my God, can you even imagine? How dare they? The good thing about it has been that it's not going unnoticed and unchallenged. The good thing about it is that there are people who are looking around like we are now and saying, wait, 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 what? How did we get here? And it's not just us. The last book I want to read you an excerpt from is called Gender Queer. It's a memoir by Maya Kababi. And uh, they wrote this, it's a graphic novel, and I wish that I had put the whole thing up here for you, but I kind of felt like I shouldn't because you should probably go buy it and, you know, contribute to Maya Kababi. <laughs> but um, the, the illustrations are all in this fashion. They're, they're beautiful, gentle cartoons. I like them. And the story is just the story of how Maya didn't feel at home in their body. And so I'm just going to read you the very beginning of it, just very short. You know, my, I should have four copies of my Kindle so I could have all four books up.
Sorry, comic books are weird. <laughs> to turn your book like this. All right, here we go. We see a young person wearing a hoodie and jeans placing items into the back of a truck. They turn away and we see the family. Do you have everything? I think so. Be smart and safe and happy. Text me every day, says the sister. I will, they say. And then we hear this. In 2013, when I was 24, I headed to San Francisco to begin my master's degree in comics. I'd spent the last several months assuring people that yes, an MFA in comics is a real thing. I entered grad school with a fiction project and no interest in, mem in memoir. However, one of my first classes was autobiography taught by Mari Naomi. A good way to start, it shows the instructor saying, is by listing your biggest secrets. At least one of them should start a story. And then we see our protagonist. No, no one gets my secrets, they're mine. I struggled in this class. The teacher, try writing some of the, down some of the things you consider your demons. Okay, and this is what I write. Girly clothes, getting my period, swimming, bathing suits, boobs. I think to myself, all of these things are about gender. I did write a short comment about one of my demons in that class, but I was so embarrassed by it that I taped pieces of paper over those pages of my sketchbook. And then we see the sketchbook, and she pulls away the paper to reveal gender queer, this book. She begins, in October 1992, my family moved into one of two houses on a 120-acre property in Northern California with no electricity and no flush toilets. I was three and a half years old and my sister was one. Our neighbors had three kids, Rebecca, Bronwyn, and Galen, my age. The property was powered by a mix of solar, hydroelectric, electric, and generators. We had a bathtub, but no shower. We filled our outdoor washing machine with the garden hose. There were two outhouses, home to many spiders. Galen and I often just peed in the yard. It just shows two little kids from the back, one standing up peeing and the other squatting down peeing. <laughs> Neither Galen nor I attended a preschool or a kindergarten. The first day of first grade was our first time mixing with other kids our age. They, they see some kids in a tree house and Galen says, can we come up and play? You can come, but not Maya. Why not? Because she's a girl and girls have cooties. And they look at each other and they're sad, but Galen goes up in the tree house and Maya goes along and says, what's a cootie? There were so many things I didn't know. My classmates knew how to paint with watercolors on wet paper. I don't know how. How to knit? I don't know how. A select few could even read. I don't know how. My teachers were very patient. It wasn't unusual for boys to wear their hair long in my class of 18 students. Four boys had hair that brushed their shoulders. I remember a field trip that I took with my class in third grade. We were visiting a farm next to a river. It was a hot afternoon and our teacher said we could take off our shoes and socks to wade. My dad was one of the trip chaperones and he took off his shirt to sit in the sun. I took my shirt off too and walked in the shallows just wearing my shorts. Some of my classmates noticed. Look, Maya took her shirt off like a boy. What? Ha ha. My teacher intervened. Maya dear, you should put your shirt back on. Why? You just, you need to. Come put it back on now. I walked back and put my shirt back on again, but I didn't feel I'd done anything wrong. It was everyone else being silly, not me. I'll stop there. It's, it's a, a beautiful, beautiful book. book. I, you know, as some of you know, one of my closest friends has been transitioning over the past two years, and I wished I had read this so much sooner, just the depth of understanding and real life, like, experience. Really, it's wonderful. I shared all these with you, not just because I want you to read them, although I do. Maybe you have never read The Color Purple for yourself, and if you haven't,
please do. It's very different from the book, the movie. The movies are great, but ah, oh, the book. And if you've never heard of The Hate You Give or Gender Queer, I hope this has been a time of uh, exploration for you. The real truth of it is that our faith can't exist without freedom of voice and speech and expression. Unitarian Universalism could have happened nowhere except in a nation that values religious freedom and freedom of speech. And so the threat here, when we see these many banned books attempts, and believe me, they're happening everywhere, you can check a school district's uh, webpage and usually find the list of books that are being challenged. You can find out more about how they're looked at. You could, if you're a member of that community, go and join one of those groups that reviews books that school, schools question or that libraries question. They, they need community members, and I'm pretty sure not our community members are going as much as some other community members, so maybe they need to balance. Mostly, though, I just want you to know that this is a fight that's been going on forever, and it's not over yet, but we know how to do this. We know how to support free expression. We know how to support these authors by purchasing their books. We know how to go to places and protest when they do. On July 2nd, the Bullock Museum in Austin canceled an event that had 300 RSVPs to talk about a book that described the ways that slavery influenced the Battle of the Alamo. It was canceled because the governor and the, what's that dude, Ken Paxton, what was his job? Yeah, it's hilarious. He's the attorney general, biggest crook in the state, excuse me. Yes, said it live and in person, sue me. Um, so these two people called and said, you have to cancel this event. And that was like the last month, that was the beginning of this month. Okay, so we know it's happening, but also, it was a big fuss, there was a big story, people are mad. You know, it's, it's the more we call attention to it. Like anti-racist baby, we gotta name it when we see it. I just wanna close really quickly with a very brief poem. Too many books. <laughs> what a terrible problem. Classes. This is by Maya Angelou, another author who has been oft banned and never put up with it with any kind of equanimity, for which I always admire her. This poem is called Human Family, and it's just, there are so many of us, we need these voices to be heard. This is what we're fighting for. I note the obvious differences in the human family. Some of us are serious. Some thrive on comedy. Some declare their lives are lived as true profundity, while others claim that they live the real reality. The variety of our skin tones can confuse, bemuse, delight. Brown and pink and beige and purple, tan and blue and white. I've sailed upon the seven seas and stopped in every land. I've seen the wonders of the world and yet not one common man. I know 10,000 women called Jane and Mary Jane, but I've never seen any two that were really the same. Mirror twins are different, although their features jive, and lovers think quite different thoughts while lying side by side. We love and lose in China, we weep on England's moors, and laugh and moan in Guinea, and thrive on Spanish shores. We seek success in Finland, and we're born and die in Maine. In minor ways we differ, in major we're the same. I note the obvious differences between each sort and type, but we are more alike, my friends, than we are unlike. We are more alike, my friends, than we are unlike. Amen.